Hi, good morning. This is John Gormley. Thank you very much for joining today. I'm Director of Solutions for AirGab Networks, and we're joined today by Art Geniselli, a 15-year solution and backup recovery architect. Good morning, Art. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, John. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself, Art. Where are you located out of and kind of what is your years of experience and what are the things you do with yourself? Thanks, John. So I've been in IT since the 90s. I've been a consultant and I've worked at Fortune 500s and worked my way through backup recovery. I currently lead a team of architects who do pre and post sales for storage compute backup and DR. So have a lot of experience. I've been working with uh, various backup technologies for over 10 years. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you very much for making the time today. But one of our conversations that we've been having with a number of customers today is the discussion around utilizing better ways for secure access into IT operation consults. Particularly, we have a lot of clients today that are using Veeam. And one of the things that keeps coming up repeatedly is that Veeam has a strategy upon how to be able to support multi-factor authentication into the consult. However, more and more clients are looking for ways in order to provide better security. What is your experience so far that you've seen with Veeam as far as people coming in remotely to access the consoles and provide management capabilities? So nowadays with backup, the primary concern is ransomware protection. And so, um, you know, Veeam themselves will tell you, be careful about how you're integrating your production active directory into your Veeam. So generally when we're doing deployments, you know, one of the things that, you know, we'll recommend is setting up your Veeam backup server, you know, outside the domain. Now you're still going to use service accounts to attach to and do your backups, but for the actual management console, you know, we're going to recommend that you use a local account or set up a separate domain, set up an extremely complex password and go that way. Uh, because the nightmare scenario that everyone's reading a lot about right now is when hackers get inside your network, uh, the professional criminal games will sit there for months and they'll get everything going. And then one of the first things they do once they decide to kick off the ransomware is they delete all your backups and go that way. And so if you're not set up immutably and, you know, you're not, you know, have a way that if someone has an admin account in your domain, if they have that, if that gives them grandfathered access into your Veeam, uh, you know, depending on your immutability policies, you could be in a world of hurt. And we've personally had clients that have had very bad situations happen from uh, backups being deleted. Uh, a particularly nasty one we saw where they got into the LUNs through the storage controllers and deleted the MBR tables, you know, of the, the LUNs. So data's there, but the MBR is gone. So now we're having to pay for expensive data recovery. So, you know, these are just nightmare scenarios. And so, you know, it's very critical to think about how you're going to architect access to your Veeam administrative console. It's an interesting because that's actually one of the strategies that many backup and recovery platforms will do is that they consider themselves a ransomware response because you can back up immediately when a ransomware is detected and then you have auto restoration capabilities. And what the Condi group proved during their hack was the ability to first not only take over the console, but delete the backups that were being used for the restore ransomware. So in some ways, they actually kind of double dipped on their ransomware. They got it on the front end encryption, and they got it on the back end preventing restoration. So some organizations potentially may have had to pay two ransoms instead of one because of how Condi successfully got into the console as well. You mentioned something very interesting about access to the consoles. And what we really are be looking at here at AirGap Networks is the ability to provide really more of a full proxy isolation connection of the users coming in remotely and not allowing them direct access anymore to the console itself. Are you starting to see more of those kind of designs being implemented in the field as well? Zero trust is a, a hot thing. The hard part uh, for most of our clients is, you know, coming in and doing a zero trust, it's very complex to do that network wide. Mm -hmm. And it's also the kind of thing you don't want a one off. And so, you know, customers, you know, coming up with the, you know, they default to, okay, well, we'll put it on, we won't put it on our production active directory and mm -hmm. we'll just come up with these complex passwords. We might MFA to a different thing, but, you know, it's considered a kind of a bigger deal to implement the zero trust, you know, most of the time. Absolutely. So what we do is why don't we you know, take a few modes and kind of walk through some of our strategies at our gap, because I think to your point, the, the complexity of zero trust definitely is dominating the landscape today uh, and is definitely causing a lot of people some challenges to implement those strategies. So I think one of the things that's really interesting about understanding you know, what we call application protection or isolation really kind of starts with the architecture. 
I know that you and I have had, you know, many times together have talked to our customers about leveraging what you have today, on top of which finding ways to augment in order to provide better adaptive control or better responsive control. So an example of what we're doing here with AirGAP's capability, more than the secure asset access portal, is the ability to take the user connections in either be front or behind VPN technology, and the ability to negotiate both MFA and single sign-on that exists already for the client today. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel as an example for any form of authentication, but that's where the actual user's connection stops. So we actually use our ability through our portal proxy isolation to create the backend connection to the Veeam console itself. So the user itself never has a direct access. So if that end user is filled with ransomware or malware or other forms of you know, hacking you know, elements going on, they can only get as far as the actual physical gateway. So pretty much acting like a proxy, right? What's really important is in this design is that more and more clients are also going into the Beam console saying, do not accept connections unless it originates from the air gap gateway. So if somebody internally, I, and I liked your analogy earlier that you talked about that hackers can sit inside the network for months. They could be sitting within an application server, a SQL environment, they could be sitting on you know, another platform just doing this reconnaissance internally. They're actually in the internal network and then they're gonna try to do an internal connection into the Veeam console. But the Veeam is not accepting even internal connections unless it resides from the source of the gateway coming in from AirGap. That obviously is a great security control that you can have as well. The other part that's also important too is the, is the ability to unify the entire access control, remote access control strategy for isolation. So not only are we focus on the ability to work within existing architectures, but we're also helping to support remote users that are trying to get into web, you know, private cloud, public cloud instances, and of course, SaaS applications as well. Because I think you brought up a really good point about the zero trust. Whenever I've had a zero trust conversation, clients just always like, oh, this is a lot of work but we know we need to have it. So are you finding that people are wanting to have an all encompassing solution or are you finding people saying, look, I'm just gonna do zero trust just for this product? So you make a good point there is uh, most clients assume that they have to go with zero trust for everything. And so everything. then they're thinking, oh God. So now we've got a, you know, cause the other part of zero trust that is a monster for most companies is it's very few organizations that have a complete application catalog and also have a complete application mapping to where they know, okay, databases connect to these app servers, these mm -hmm. app servers connect to these web servers. Okay, we use these ports, which are all the things that you need to know for a zero trust architecture. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have it, you know, it's, or the other part is, oh, well, we have vCenter, so <laughs> we can attach something to vCenter that would track all that. And then someone goes, oh, wait, but we have the AS400 and that doesn't use vCenter. Doesn't work. It. Exactly. Yeah, and so then it's like, Oh, well, that was implemented 20 years ago. So what do we do about that? So right. yeah, these are all, so this is where the conversation stops of, okay, well, we'll just wing it. We'll do this other thing because that other thing is just way too hard. And that's, in the you mentioned about AS400s so that a lot of our customers today have existing OT and ICS technologies today within water systems that do not have a web front end, do not have any you know ability to load agents onto these host environments and they have to rely upon other systems like us in order to provide that legacy connection or that private connection to them as well. And that really kind of plays into the strength of what AirGap is really coming to market with. So the ability to not only unify remote access, but doing so with either web application or obviously connecting to legacy systems as well. And the nice thing is that again, because it's being a proxy isolation, it also is providing that protection to those devices as well. So I know from our, you and I have known each other a long time from a networking member, we used to use SSJ and just Cisco routers all the time. Well, now we can actually have a full, you know, isolation proxy capability to the same devices as well. And, when we talk I, I, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, uh, and with regard to that, another thing I just thought of here for this that I hadn't thought of before of, mm -hmm. you know, lately we've been hearing about all these zero day vulnerabilities that are coming out for different networking appliances, exactly. especially for SSH and other things. And so, yeah, if you had this sitting in front of it, it wouldn't be as nearly a, a 911 emergency. You know. Exactly. And I think that's interesting. You also mentioned about all encompassing versus one offs. And what are your thoughts as far as having really flexible policy deployment? I know that whenever we deploy a security product and we've been doing it for years, it always comes down to can we leverage an AD group? Can we use a private group? Do we have to make it complex or can we just start off simply by saying, okay, this is the Veeam consult admin group. These are the members of it. And then this is the people that are allowed to connect on this port and protocol. 
are you seeing people kind of step into this kind of strategy or are you seeing people saying we're going to make this a project and it's going to take us a year to deploy it's generally the the project that's going to take a year to deploy and what's really insidious about these projects unfortunately is uh, we run into this all the time is well the admin group for that you know remote connectivity was set up two years ago we didn't Thank ever you. set up the shadow group in active directory and so now I can't tell you if everyone in there is still a valid user and it's always a pain when we add someone new because we've got to remember everything to add them to so yeah something that would help people with that would be a huge benefit that's a that's a good point because that's why if you know we signify within our product capability is simplicity of use simplicity of policy creation because we do want people to leverage technology very early we have a very quick time to value on getting our products deployed uh, particularly when it comes into isolation i know today that many of our clients say that are using direct connect capabilities directly to these IT operation consoles have come back saying, well, how quick can we get this operation? How quick can we get the air gap, you know, security asset access platform available? And as you and I kind of walk through, it's very, very quick to enable, but more importantly, you can do it on a per growth basis. You can start with this console, make that isolated connection, then go to the routers and the switches and the firewalls and the IDSs and anything else that you want to have kind of remote access, you know, strategy into, but leveraging either to your point, a very convoluted a group group or you can use private group you know strategy as well if you choose other things also i know that comes up because i know you deal a lot with identity you know there's there's the octa breach that happened back in january that took a little while for you know for everybody to get a grip of what happened there you've also had paying uh, and others that have come out in the market duels done very well for themselves you know what what are you seeing now as far as when you're about to deploy a new storage or a new backup recovery does, is single sign-on part of that strategy on day one, or is it just getting the backup and recovery working first? Uh, it's get the backup and recovery working. Uh, and then generally, you know, once we have the initial backup set, then the question comes in of, okay, well, you know, prove ransomware recovery. And then after that, <laughs> we'll bring up at that point, okay, so let's talk single sign-on MFA. How are we going to get that involved? Interesting. And yeah, we go, you know, that's kind of the order of operations of how these things are done. But do, you, do you still see that going? The reason I was having a little bit of smile on my face is that, you know, we've been in this almost 28 years together and oh. yeah, it's like, it's get the thing working first, then security versus yeah. getting security to work first, then get the product. It just seems like everyone's still thinking the old days of, hey, look, I'm just happy if we can just get that thing running, then please get security, then please get factor authentication versus it being, this is not going production until we have security. What do you think, do you think ransomware is going to change that mindset that people are gonna say, we're not gonna turn on this function unless it meets our multi-factor strategy, our security strategy, our, our isolation strategy on day one, or do you still think that pressing to get the function working first is still gonna be the dominant conversation? So the way it generally works is, you know, there's the business driver of whatever the project is. Mm -hmm. uh, security is definitely involved. Security, most organizations tend to give things a pass unless they have remote access. They'll give it a temporary pass of like, okay, get it implemented. Right. Okay. You know, and because also with pen testing and things, security will tell you, well, if it's not in place, there's nothing for me to test. So they'll say, get it up and running the way you want. Please, you know, follow these practices. You know, like they might give us some you know, documentation on, okay, well, these virtual appliances have to be set up this way and so on and so forth, you know, they'll go down that way, but it's not until it's actually set up that security will really come in there and look at it hardcore and go, oh, you guys are open on this port or why is this doing this and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of generally is, you know, the business needs something, we set that up. And then before it goes, you know, sometimes it goes full production before, but a lot of times security has to do their final say so especially if there's any public facing, it's definitely got to get, you know, checked first. But if it's not public facing, sometimes they'll go, okay, well, you can bring it in production, but then it's kind of under a remediation period. So it's, that's yeah. what we've seen in the field. That's that's a good thing to know, because one of the reasons that we, we really pride ourselves on ease of use when we're deploying our SA portal is that we know that you're not getting a lot of time to implement security. You got to get whatever that has been purchased, whether it's a backup recovery, whether it's a new firewall or whether it's a new host or something, but the nice thing is that if we can come in, leverage existing MFA or single sign-on strategies, plug into them relatively easily, and most importantly of all, make it seamless, that it, it's already part of the user experience today, then we can get our product up quickly, provide the security you're looking for. And then, of course, to your point, the whole point of doing this whole thing is because you wanted to get your backup and recovery working. 
quickly, right? So I think as long as we're simple and easy on the front end, then we can definitely help meet you know some of the business requirements as well. So a couple of the things also that kind of come top of mind um, that are, I really want to get your your take on today is when we start talking more about when things don't work. So backup and recovery doesn't work. Other IT controls don't work. There, you know, a lot of this is sort of internal. Some of it is expanding to the cloud. When when things don't work, how quickly does things have to get fixed, or is it still going through root cause analysis, analysis and paralysis? What are you finding that when some of these critical IT systems fail, like vCenter or and when MFA failed, when, when Okta failed, as an example, how how are you seeing people still going through the rudimentary troubleshooting, or is it like I got to have it up and running now type of mindset? So when when you get hit with ransomware, that is really when you find out how developed your IT organization is. Okay. Uh, the best organizations, uh, I mean, that person gets responded to within minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, their accounts disabled. You know, like that whatever host is causing that it's shut down immediately and you really minimize the damage yes um if you're not a well um a well-designed organization things can go out of control it can be hours before you notice problems uh and then you know at that point too generally if you hit that point you may not even have thought through your head okay well what would we do if we had got attacked in a ransomware and uh, I was on a call a year ago um, where so a client, uh, someone we'd never talked to calls us emergency, whatever. You know, they heard of us. We get on the phone. I'm working with them. They call another network security company. And this mm -hmm. ransomware attack, it's over Zoom. Uh, so we're, I'm not directly connected into them. And we're talking to them. And this net security company had worked with them before. And the security, I'm telling the company, shut down everything. You need to cut your WAN access, get every, because it's a multi-site organization. Security company's like, no, uh, we need to look at what's in RAM and give me VPN credentials. And I'm like, there's an active attack going on. Right. The guy, the other security consultants, VPN, they immediately got owned. You know, and so you're sitting there going, then they did agree to shut everything down. But the point is, is that, you know, I'd been through this, this other security company clearly hadn't been through it and the client hadn't been through it. So they weren't, you know, you know, we know that, okay, if you're getting hit. Yeah, in a perfect world, you'd love to be able to analyze it and RAM and all that, but they were not in a place where they could, you know, partition off a system and, you know, look at it deeply. You know, in those situations, you just want to bring it down as quickly as possible and stop the damage, you know. And so, you know, uh, something like this, what you're describing, would be a good stopgap for those organizations that haven't done the full tabletop exercise, haven't thought through this. This would at least give them something, or, you know, with those consultants come in through air gap don't attach right. your laptop right. to you know a site that's being actively hacked you know things like that right i think that's a good that's a very good point because ultimately everybody doesn't know what to do many times when there is a ransomware outbreak as well and many times you know shutting off remote access or, or at least putting a much higher level of security to remote access is critical but if people are not connecting directly to the back ends, you're minimizing the risk immediately. And I think that's one of our real values of our doing our user isolation functionalities that if you do have hordes of people coming in that are creating these ransomware attacks against the internal hosts, you know, the ability to kind of kick them back to that proxy layer and then you know mitigate internally using micro segmentation from air gap you know the ability to kind of isolate every host individually and you know activate the ransomware kill switch and other things that you can mitigate extremely quickly where in the old days it was stop analyze process review conference call analyze by then the entire environment has been completely shredded you know with ransomware so no I, I, that's a very good architectural point you're bringing is if i keep everybody back on that proxy level and i'm using those back end separated SLO connections to those hosts themselves i'm mitigating more importantly that if there is infection coming in that i can be able to have a shutoff valve you know pretty quickly available as well yep so well, sir, thank you very much for making time today, Art. We yep. really appreciate an industry expert like yourself for coming on today. Thank you for joining us in our conversation today with AirGap Networks. And I wish you the very best. And thank you, everyone, for joining our session today as well. Thank you, John. Thank you.